I will be reading from 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20, and then also a passage from Matthew 5, 27 through 30. You may have follow along in your Bibles or on the screen behind me. 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20. I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Matthew 5, 27 to 30. You have heard that it is said you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Do you want to move forward? Okay. <laughs> Logistics. <laughs> so, we have, or are talking about unity. We've been working through this letter to the Corinthians, where Paul sees this disunity forming in the church, people pulling away from each other and not getting along. And it sort of feels like it shouldn't really surprise us that the topic of our sexuality comes up when we are looking at unity and disunity. Hmm. I'm just going to throw this out real quickly. Um, I'm going to try and keep moving. So the, <laughs> I do think I've been trying to avoid this sermon for a long, long time. And when I get nervous, I sometimes uh, make a lot of jokes. I'm going to try really hard not to do that. That'd be good. <laughs> uh, that's why I brought Nana up here to be with me. <laughs> because I'm terrified. Mm -hmm. um, she's my moral support. Uh, so basically, it is my belief that our ability to know our spouse in a biblical sense is one of the greatest gifts that God has given to us to create unity, to bind two people together in an emotional and bodily sort of sense or form. So it should not surprise us at all that human beings have taken that which is an incredible, amazing gift and turned it into something that it is not supposed to be, something that divides us, something that hurts, something that brings pain and breaks people. This is what we do. So Paul has many words for us. Also, there are words from Jesus himself, from Matthew 5, 27. I think we're going to kind of roll into that first. I've been holding off. We did a sermon series on uh, the, the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount a long time ago, and this, when this came up, it just didn't quite fit for that Sunday and all that was going on, so I kicked it down the road, and I've continued to kick it down the road. 
And to be honest, I was kind of hoping that we wouldn't have church today because of the snow. <laughs> when I looked at the computer and it said that it was just going to rain, I thought I might just cry. Um, so Matthew the 5.27, Nana, um, says that we are supposed to gouge out our eyes if we look upon someone sinfully. If we look upon someone lustfully, we are supposed to gouge out our eyes so that our entire body is not thrown into hell. Those are some <laughs> strong words. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I personally don't think, I don't believe that Jesus actually was saying, go and gouge out your eyes. But it's really strong language because he knew, Jesus knew how much hurt and pain and destruction um, lust can bring. It says that the eyes are the windows to the soul. And so we often hear that and, and we often equate it. And it's true, when you look into somebody's eyes, often you can see what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what they've been through, the pain that they're feeling. But also, it works in the opposite way too. So the things we look at, the things we see, the things we watch, the things we allow our eyes to see, go in, those things go into our soul. And it starts with the eyes. It all starts with the eyes, and so what we see, we are taking into our soul. Hmm. In a way, it's kind of, you know, I, I equate so many things to eating. In a way, it's like if we're eating garbage and we're intaking garbage into our bodies, our bodies will express that. We will, mm -hmm. you know, we will become unhealthy. Yeah. If we are taking in things with our eyes, it is making unhealthy our very spirit our very souls. Now, he used the word lust here. This is not just a looking um, sort of, it's not just a looking at something and saying, well, isn't that beautiful? It's a looking at something with a deep longing and desire to have. Mm -hmm. I look lustfully at cars, or we might look lustfully at houses, or I might look lustfully at a chocolate chip cookie, and we look lustfully at people. Mm. And when we do that, those things like the car, like the house, like the cookie become an object, something to be conquered and not a human being. Yeah, actually scientists have studied lust and how it affects your brains, our brains, the brain. And lust actually, um, they begin to notice that lust causes different pathways to form in your brain. Um, and lust starts becoming these, a reality to us, these fantasies of what we want, these desires become so deep. Um, our world becomes a fantasy world and, and this dissatisfaction, we, have, we don't have it, we don't have it, we don't have it, we need it, we need it. And like you said, people all of a sudden become objects. It takes the humanity out of people and out of this world. Um, and dissatisfaction, um, then begins to leak into our marriages. It leaks into our relationships. It leaks into our church community, our neighborhood, um, and causes such destruction and such pain. Uh, Nate, it almost sounds like we're talking about the P word. Is it time mm. to talk about pornography? <laughs> it's your show. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, statistics would say, so I've heard, Statistics say, and this, I think this is going to blow your mind unless you've heard this from me before, but statistics have found that one in four Christian men, so you would think maybe one in four church-going Christian men, let's not do the math, mm -hmm. one in four Christian men are addicted to pornography. One in four Christian men are addicted to pornography. I think it starts with little things. You know, for many, many years, my mother got the Sports Illustrated, sw uh, Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue for me for, my, for Christmas. No. <laughs> my mother got Sports <laughs> Illustrated for me for Christmas. Now I'm really starting to sweat. And every year, that Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue would come. And this, the question is, what do we do with this? You know, and it's that whole, you know, there's got to be some really good sports articles in there somewhere, I'm sure. And we start to look and we start to page through and we see these pictures of perfect women that are so perfect it's unimaginable, and those thoughts go, start creeping into our minds. And as Nana said, the mind actually starts to be flooded with um, like the pleasure 
um, the, the synapses and chemicals in our brain that are saying, hey, this is awesome, I really like this. It's how God gets us to come together to have lots of children and multiply and make the earth um, filled with people. But it also then, when it doesn't really involve someone that we've made a commitment to for our, the entirety of our lives, can, can become a problem. And it grows into this thing, and we want to see more, and we want to see more. And now with the internet and how easy it is to get a hold of things, um, it's really, it's unbelievable what it does to us. Mm -hmm. and again, I love my studies. I never back them up because I read them and then I forget where I saw the stuff. <laughs> studies have shown that pornography literally breaks down our relationships. Mm -hmm. Pornography empowers anxiety and depression when so many people go there because they're anxious or depressed. Mm -hmm. Pornography also creates deeper sense of feelings of loneliness and again, it's often lonely people that go there, mm -hmm. and it makes it worse. So, Hunter, you're talking about um, pornography, and so often when we say pornography, we automatically think men, the struggle that men have, the struggle that men have. But in reality, women struggle with pornography, and, and, the, and the statistics are alarming as well, um, as many uh, men that struggle, women struggle as well. Um, and like you were saying with the internet, so often, um, you know, there's those romance books out there that we never wanted anyone to see us reading, but now with Kindles and the internet, everything is, it can really be in the dark. Our sins can be in the dark. Um, the other day, Kevin and I were having this discussion, and I turned around, and there is Adam, my youngest, all snuggly in my bed on my phone. Um, and I looked to see what it was playing, and it was a Mickey Mouse game, okay, so just so you know. Um, but I thought, my six-year-old, my six-year-old, he, he knows how to, how to get on my phone better than I do. I mean, he's posting stuff on my Facebook account, and I don't even know, you know, like the games he wins, and people are like, all right, Nana, you're playing Mickey Mouse? Um, and, and so I was thinking, really, Satan works this way in that it's not all of a sudden you wake up and, oh my goodness, I'm addicted to pornography. But it starts with the little things. And he wants to, he wants to hook our kids. And I, I really thought, Lord, not only do I have to monitor what's going into my eyes and into my soul, but parents, I have to, we, I am challenging myself and us to really start monitoring and putting checks and parent checks on what our kids are watching and what they're seeing because it starts with the little things and that can start a life of addiction that started with just one glance on the internet at age six. So we're going to look a little bit more deeply into the Paul passage, but I just want to recognize, to flip back to it, in verse 16 of chapter 6, Paul says that we need to flee from sexual immorality. We need to flee from, we need to run from as far away as we can possibly get. Men, we are not animals. Paul talks in Galatians chapter 5 about a battle between the spirit and the flesh. The spirit is that which is of God. The flesh is that which is of this world. It's our body. It's in these desires that are within us. We need to fight them. We need to let the spirit win and not the flesh we need to believe that we are in control of ourselves or that somehow with God's help, we can be. We must take responsibility for that which we see with our eyes, for that which we take in. We throw the Sports Illustrated issue, Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue into the trash, along with the Victoria's Secret catalog that comes because of the family that lived in the house before us. <laughs> A short skirt or a pair of yoga pants is not an invitation to undress someone with our eyes. The world says that men are supposed to look. The world says that we're supposed to make jokes, that we're supposed to leer at women. The world says in the locker room, people can say anything, it's mm -hmm. not a big deal, it doesn't matter but it does. Men, we need to make some changes. We need new ideas of what it means to be men. Mm. It is a picture of respect that looks like Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. 
filled with integrity and brotherly, sisterly love. As a woman, I 100, 150% agree with that. The way a woman dresses must never, ever, ever, ever be an excuse for an abuse or unwanted advances, ever, ever, period. It's not even just the way they dress, right? No, It's the nothing. things they would say, the things that we do. There's never, ever a reason. Yeah, thank never. you. However, as a mom of three boys, I totally, I just want to, I want you girl moms to know I sympathize with you. Really, how do you buy clothing for your daughters? It must be so hard because everywhere you go, the clothing is always seems to be two sizes too small. We are living in a world of mixed messages, women and girls. On one hand, we are told that we are powerful, we are strong, we are independent, we can do anything, and we can. We are strong, we are powerful, we are intelligent. But then on the other hand, we're still seeing advertisements of women with unattainable bodies, with a lot of skin showing. And so my question is the, is the message of you're powerful, but the way we're powerful is to be sexy and alluring and enticing. And that's how we have to dress. That's how we have to act. My heart just breaks for the women and the girls in, in, in our generation because of these mixed, hard, painful messages. And my encouragement to us is women, let's check ourselves and, uh, and teach our daughters to really ask, why are we dressing this way? How are we dressing? Who are we dressing for? And to check our hearts and recognize that we are daughters of the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he is the one that we are to be impressing and living for. All right, let's turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's, let's spend a little bit of time there. One of the things that we'll notice as we look at this Scripture is that Paul has these sayings in quotes. He believed that those were sayings, those are sayings that he has heard that have been coming out of the Corinthians. One of those sayings is, I had the right to do anything. Now, these were relatively new Christians, and Paul has been teaching them about grace in Jesus, that you have grace in Christ, and through Christ you are forgiven so you can do anything, right? You can be powerful, you can be wonderful, you can save people, you can heal people. Uh, in a way, they were hearing this and saying, oh, because of God's grace, I can do whatever I want. So I have the right to do anything. Paul says, you do, and I can tell you that not everything is beneficial. Maybe we'll talk about chocolate chip cookies again. <laughs> it's my way to sneak around things sometimes. So, I am a 45-year-old man. If there were a box of chocolate chip cookies right here beside the two of us, a two-pound box of chocolate chip cookies, and I wanted to eat each and every one of them, I could. There's no law against it. This is my body. If I want to eat two pounds of chocolate chip cookies, I can eat two pounds of chocolate chip cookies. But that doesn't mean it would be good for me. That doesn't mean that Nana Sue or my beloved wife should be like, here, eat another pound. <laughs> you seem to be enjoying it so much. The flavor of the chocolate chips and the sugar and mm, I love chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> it also says, and maybe this is where the idea comes from, food for the stomach, stomach for the food. God will destroy them both. Again, this is in quotes. This is what they're saying. Mm -hmm. They're saying, if it tastes good, eat it. If it feels good, do it. And by, uh, this body is going to be destroyed anyway. We're going to be resurrected, right? Our soul is going to be resurrected. But we remember, I preached a sermon a couple weeks ago. A part of Paul's issue with these Corinthians was that they believed that our body would not be resurrected. They believed that the body was not part of the resurrection. This body is not even a part of our experience with Christ. And Paul's saying, no. Your body, somehow, I have no idea how, and I believe it's going to be without achy knees and maybe without a few pounds, hopefully. <laughs> this body is going to be resurrected. What we do to the body now matters. Mm -hmm. What we do to our bodies now impacts how we worship God. It impacts how we serve God. The protection and care that we give to our bodies is important. I even talked about prostitution. You know, at this time, prostitution was legal. It was almost expected. Mm -hmm. But we know what Paul says about that. We come together, we become one flesh. 
It matters. It's important how we go about that. So um, I keep hearing you talk about our body, my body, my body. Um, I was on vacation with my three boys and another teenage boy, and I am telling you the phrase I heard over and over and over again is, where's my phone? Where's my phone? Where's my phone? Has anyone heard that from their kids? Where's my phone? Where's my phone? Finally, I was so frustrated, and I'm hoping that my English people in here are going to say that I'm right. I finally yelled at them. I was like, what is the pronoun in that sentence? Hunter, do you know what the pronoun is? My. My, that's right, my phone. They were so cons- were so focused on me, right? Me, 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 it's my body, I'm not gonna hurt anyone, me, me, me. But if we get back to what lust does to the brain, so the chemical in the brain that kind of um, is our pleasure, our gratification is called dopamine. And when people um, use Um, abuse drugs and alcohol, that is the chemical that is released. And they become addicts and they need it more and more and more. And so we were talking about how the world all of a sudden becomes just objects, an uh, an end to a a means to an end. And so oftentimes we hear about addicts um, stealing from their family and their friends and other things. And they don't, I mean, you're not family anymore. You're just a means to an end. Um, And that is what happens when our body are seeking that gratification, that lust. So, um, you know, that need for more money, to make more, to get that car. It doesn't matter who I step over. It doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter if my family is destroyed because of it. It doesn't matter if I don't see my kids until, you know, they're growing up and I miss out on it because I want that and I want that money. And then with sexual gratification, it becomes more and more and more. And people do not, aren't people anymore. They are means to an end. And so women and, and men, because there is, please hear me, there, the, the, the abuse of women we hear a lot more about, but there is sexual assault with men as well. And men and women become objects, a need to, a means to an end. And so all of a sudden we're hearing these names in the news, Sandusky, Nasser, Spacey, Weinstein, Weinstein. They were thinking about their, my gratification, and they leave behind a wake of pain and brokenness and hurt. So it's not my body. We have to recognize that the things that we do, the, the need for gratification is hurting those around us as well and destroying families, churches, communities, and our world. And we know so obviously through the Catholic Church, but it's not just the Catholic Church that it mm-hmm. enters this body. Mm-hmm. It's a part of us. And I think the church has responded poorly. I guess there's a part of me that even feels like as a pastor of a church, on the behalf of the greater church, I need to confess. We have failed. We have failed in our job to make the world a better place. We have failed in our job to bring healing. We have failed in our job to bring hope. I think that abuse scares us, Mm -hmm. and we don't know what to do with it, so we deny it or we pretend that it's not true. When we do this, we hurt the victim even more. Mm. Imagine a child who has been hurt that goes to their parent. And I'm going to be honest with you, I've heard more about this than I I can ever imagine that I ever should. A child that goes to their parent and tells them what happened, and their parent says, don't talk about it. Let's not ever bring that up again. And suddenly that child has been injured twice because the parents are the people that are supposed to protect them. And we as parents have said, I'm not going to be there for you when you need me. Then the child is broken even more deeply. And then the victim begins to blame themselves because we've got to blame someone. And if we're not allowed to talk about this other person, it couldn't have been them. And the wounds continue to grow. As followers of Jesus, you need to know that Jesus weeps and his heart is broken for those who have been hurt and victimized and abused. The statistics are out there, and you can, you can go and see them, but statistically, one in four people have been sexually abused. One in four. One in four have been sexually abused. It's a real issue, and 
We as a body of believers have the ability through the grace of Jesus, the love, the healing power of Jesus to build up a community of believers, to surround people, to love them, to, to empower them, to walk through a healing process and to know who they are, who they were created to be in Jesus Christ. But we also have the power to destroy and tear down. So ultimately, the question that I ask is, you know, how do we, what do we need to do? What is our job? I always need to know, I need to know, what is my job as a follower of Jesus? And I think the first thing that we need to recognize is that we need to stand against abuse. We have to, have to, have to stand against abuse. When someone comes to us and tells us something in private, we need to help them to walk that journey. We need to stand up against. We need to speak out. You know, one of the ways that we do this as a church is with our child protection policy, and I know that that child protection policy to many of you is a tremendous annoyance. We don't want to fill out the paperwork, or we think because we have to fill out the paperwork, maybe we shouldn't even work with our children. But we have to, have to, have to do the child protection policy because we have to keep our children safe. If we can't keep our children safe, we may as well not even be here doing what we do. We have to confront pornography. We have to cast it out of our lives, the things that we see. We have to take control. And maybe for us, if we are addicts already, we just need to fall on our knees and confess and pray. And then we need to find groups that we trust, that we can talk to, that will hold us accountable. There's a scripture in Revelation that talks about um, Satan is destroyed in the end by the blood of the Lamb which we had nothing to do with. It's pay, Jesus came and died. His, his, his blood was shed. And that victory was won. But the second part of that scripture is Satan was destroyed through the power of their testimony. And you all know that my, my platform right now, I don't know if that's the right word, but my, my passion right now for our church, the church, is that we start being real. And that means if Satan is destroyed by the power of our testimony, church, we have got to start talking and we've got to start getting real. We, Hunter and I, and the staff want you to know that this is a safe place. If you have been hurt, if you have been abused, if you have have been a victim in any way, we want you to know that we want you to come and talk to us. Our hearts are breaking along with yours. We want to walk with you through this journey. It is not your fault. And we want to be a safe haven for you where you can begin this journey of knowing who you are, that you are beautiful, that Christ is weeping along with you, and his desire is that you know you are his beloved. We have to start talking to one another, and we have to start holding each other accountable. We're also, we want to be a safe place where we can be real with one another and say, this is my struggle. Sister, this is my struggle. Brother, this is my struggle. Will you walk with me as I get healing through Jesus? Finally, I think we need to create new images of what it means to be men and women for our children. I think that we need to teach our boys that they are allowed to cry. Mm-hmm. We need to teach our boys that bullying is completely unacceptable. We need to teach our boys how to treat women with respect, how to treat people with respect. We need to teach our daughters that they are strong and independent. We need to show them that yes. with leaders like Nana Sue up front and leaders in our church that are women. We are strong, we are powerful. And we have say, we can, as men, teach our boys how to be a different kind of man. Now, we had a video. There's a really, I, I, I never, ever would suggest anyone watch a video, uh, a Gillette video, to learn, uh, because I feel like you need to shave. <laughs> I know there's some wonderful people in here that have awesome, wonderful beards, but there is on the internet, and I think you can go and try and YouTube it, because for, we couldn't quite get the system to work this morning. But there's an awesome video that Gillette just put out about um, raising up young boys that's saying, you know, is this, is their, their motto is, uh, is this the, the, wait a minute, something about the best a man can get. Mm. And what they're saying is, let's make the best boys that we can possibly make. So we want to 
train up and raise our children to be different from what we've experienced in our world. We can change this world. We can make it a better place. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how we're closing that up. We're going to go into, and we're going to participate in communion today. And I'm going to go into some details about how we do that because we have to or we get confused. But I think the most important thing for us as we take communion today is recognizing that we are a body of Christ together, that we need each other, that we need each other to survive. And Jesus' blood, His forgiveness is here for each and every one of us. And then we need that forgiveness, and we need the bread of life to live and to grow, and we need each other. So we'll participate in communion today with those thoughts as a backdrop.